right. <clears throat> All right. All right. Thanks everyone for, uh, for coming today. Really appreciate it. And uh, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone uh, to uh, have your uh, uh, audio muted uh, during the seminar. Um, and also uh, please do not attempt to turn on your video or share your screen during the talk. Um, there'll be an opportunity afterwards for the audience to ask questions live at the end of the talk, just like at a normal uh, defense. And once Justin's finished his talk, you can use your Zoom to raise your hand feature uh, to notify uh, me if you'd like to ask Justin a question. And the, the raised hand feature is located just under the reactions tab at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, and, and then at that time, you're invited to turn on your video uh, during the question <clears throat> portion of time. So anyway, thank you for that. And uh, so it's really happy and uh, pleased to uh, introduce the next uh, Pacific Shark Research Center to student to uh, finish her thesis. Today, we have Justin Cordova will be speaking on descriptions of deep sea cat sharks um, <clears throat> from the Southern Indian Ocean. And I'm really pleased to uh, introduce Justin. It's been a long road, buddy. And um, thanks everyone for coming. And Justin, go ahead and take it away, pal. All right, thank you for that, Dave. And thank you for everyone that came to this talk. I'll go ahead and start off with my talk on deep sea cat sharks from the Southwestern Indian Ocean. All right, so the outline is gonna be as followed. I'll start off with my introduction and study questions followed by a materials and methods, uh, then into taxonomic accounts where I'll look at the species that were encountered in the study with a statistical analysis result, and then finally go into my discussion where I will compare the two Aperture species, and finally into my conclusion. So Aperturus is part of the Carcharhino order Carcharhinoforms, which is one of the largest extant species out there. It's typically lumped with the Ciliarhinidae, which are known as cat sharks. Um, Typically, they're known as the largest group, but recent studies have suggested that uh, the families actually separated into two groups, Ciliorhinidae and Pentecidae. Uh, Capano first noticed uh, the separation with the absence of a supraorbital crest located in the cranium, uh, where Pentecidae lacked the crest and Ciliorhinids had the cr crest. <clears throat> um, Genetic uh, studies also discovered that this separation is valid as well and would make Pentacidae the largest uh, family compared to Ciliaranidae. The identification of Aberturus are as follows. They're typically this uh, elongated cylindrical bodied uh, shark with uh, elongated eyes, a very distinct um, snout with a, a wedge-like uh, shape to them. The crest of the Ampulae of Lorenzini make these awesome crest-like patterns on both the dorsal and ventral side of the snout. Their caudal fin is separated from the anal fin by just a notch. And there are 39 species uh, within the genus, making this one of the largest extant species out, uh, largest extant groups out there. Uh, although there are different and it's a, ver a very diverse group. Any kind of obvious differences among them is kind of hard to find. Uh, typically they have a very similar look to them. Their morphology is pretty conserved. So actually identify them, identifying them can be challenging if not well-versed in the group. Other identification challenges that kind of precede the group is sexual dimorphism, where you can see at the top right with Apisterus campi, uh, males have this very uh, distinct arc to their mouth with larger teeth, and females having a very low arc to their mouth with uh, smaller teeth. There's also individual variations, uh, outdated descriptions and images. As you can see on the right of the bottom, the original holotype drawing for Aperturus campi uh, done in 1972 compared to the updated FAO drawing, where I think this is more an accurate description of, or of, of uh, Aperturus campi. Uh, continue on, uh, continuing on with uh, identification challenges are the ontogenetic changes. So if you look at the top right, you can see neonates of Aperturus brunius dermal denticles, where they have 
these very needle-like dermal denticles and a specialized dermal denticle that helps them break through egg cases. As they grow, the morphology changes where you can see the juvenile, they still retain the needle-like uh, structures to the dem dermal denticles, but are starting to form a, a more broad tricuspid look. And then finally into their uh, mature stage in having very broad tricuspid dermal denticles. Uh, one thing to kind of circumnavigate and kind of make sure you don't fall into any of these traps in identification is having type specimens. This is kind of your reference point for the species in question, and they're very helpful when uh, keying out different species since the original descriptions were based on those type specimens. But even then, they have their inherent issues. Uh, from the 39 species, 20 are known from only one holotype, with four of them being lost or completely destroyed, as you can see in the picture to the right. Um, 11 species are known from a type series of less than 10, and eight species known from a modest to good series of more than 10 type specimens. So it's kind of hard to get uh, your hands on some of these specimens for a good amount of these sharks. Uh, another way to kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, organize the group and have a easier way of identifying species is to put them in subgroups. Attempts have been made since 1934 with using structures like the gills air up to the no Siri and then other structures like liver morphology. The most uh, detailed is Capano in 1988 when he made 10 subgroups uh, within the genus. But Nikai and Sato finally uh, proposed a three species group, uh, subgroup with Longicephalus group, Spongiceps group, and Brunius group. Uh, the four characteristics that were uh, discovered to be of importance were the number of spiral valves, the relative length of the upper and lower labial furrows, inner orbital length versus snout length, and the uh, cephalic sensory canal, whether it's continuous or not. Other supporting characteristics were um, the dermal denticles, as you can see at the top. Uh, Aperturus amphiceps has a very unicuspid, spaced out dermal denticles that hardly overlap. Uh, Spongiceps generally have uh, more spaced out co uh, denticles compared to the Brunius and Longicephalus but all, all Longicephalus and Brunius species have this overlapping uh, dermal denticle pattern. Uh, continuing to support this, genetic studies have recognized them to be distinct groups. Uh, the only thing that was added was the identification of Longicephalus group being a sister group of the Spongiceps group. So the long nose Aperturus group was more related to one of the short-nosed. And finally, Brooke Fulameng, uh, a alumni from Moss Lang Marine Labs, did a thesis looking into the cat uh, the egg case morphology of these cat sharks, finding that Spongiceps groups lacked tendrils, where Brunius had these tendrils at the ends of uh, the egg cases. Currently, this is the split up of all three groups with Longicephalus being the smallest with five, Spongiceps group with 13, and Brunius being the large with 21. Uh, they have a worldwide distribution with the exception of the South Pole. They inhabit continental slopes and submarine canyons and inhibit, uh, inhabit 400 to 2000 meters in depth. None of them are known for any long migrations due to the morphology of their fins. And even though there are no uh, long migrations, some species are known to travel up into the upper water columns. And for the most part, many of them are endemic with the exception of five species. The breakup of uh, the distribution of these Amphisturus is as follows, where 12 are in the Indian Ocean, 10 are from the Atlantic, and 20 from the West Pacific. 
Uh, our improved understanding of deep water fauna globally has been largely due to the advancements of fishing technology. This is largely driven to our uh, need for new sources of protein as coastal resources are used. Uh, boats have been traveling further and into deeper waters. With this, more deep sea cat sharks and other deep sea chondrichthines are found. Uh, refined taxonomic techniques have also helped with the identification of species, being that Nikaya et al. developed a methodology paper which looked at specific characteristics to tease out species within the groups instead of a general carcharinid shark form. These sharks are common in bycatch, uh, but typically they're discarded and recorded under the general name of shark or other. Uh, because there's no fishery for them, they're generally understudied and little is known about their life history. That being said, effects are poorly understood because of this. The IUCN red list currently labels 21% of the genus as data deficient and 79% as least concern. The Food and Agricultural Organization of the United States, or the FAO, has implemented an international plan of action for the conservation of chondrichthians. And in their list of suggestion, uh, suggestions, uh, species identification is one of their major goals. Uh, currently in the Western Indian Ocean, there are six species known to inhabit the area, with four being from the Brunius group, one from the Longicephalus, and one from the Spongiceps group. Uh, recent expeditions have uncovered new spe or multiple species of Apristurus, and this study will look into the identification of Apristurus species uh, belonging to the Spongiceps group within the fishing area known as Area 51. Uh, the first uh, study objective will be to identify and describe Apristurus species belonging to the Spongiceps group within the Western Indian Ocean and identify sexual dimorphic characteristics within the species. Moving on to our materials and methods. Two expeditions were done in 2012 and 2014 in the broad region uh, south of the Madagascar Ridge on Walter Shoal and in multiple locations in the Southwest Indian Ridge. Uh, all all uh, specimens were caught aboard the fishing vessel Will Watch uh, using Nikaya and Sato's uh, characteristics. It was identified that two species group belong to the Spongiceps group with species one having four specimens, one male and three female and species two having eight with three males and five females. Morphometric and meristic measurements were taken using, uh, using Nakaya et al's methodology paper. All measurements were used using calipers and all measurements were taken to the nearest millimeter. Uh, for the data analysis, data standardization was done using uh, measurements as a percent of the total body length. Uh, in a broad uh, notion, ordination is a technique used to simplify uh, multi-dimensional data to reduce uh, it from many dimensions to just a few important. So this allows us to graph them and interpret them. Uh, as you can see in the picture of the right, uh, this is a metric MDS, uh, which uses Euclidean distance between points on a map to assess the space between points with more space representing greater difference and less space representing greater similarities. So, you know, a trip from Los Angeles to Moss Landing is significantly uh, smaller than Seattle to Miami. Uh, we're gonna use an NMDS. So there are multiple types of ordination, but NMDS is a non-parametric test. So it makes no assumptions about the uh, suitable distance measures, and it uses an <clears throat> interactive method for creating the best ordination, so more it is more flexible than the metric MDS. So it will be uh, useful to help um, in our study questions when we are using a multidimensional database with a lot of different measurements, 
in physical measurements of various groupings of cat sharks, both looking at the species and gender separations with the hopes of finding clusters or with finding cluster, uh, clusters either uh, overlapping or separated. Uh, if the clusters are seen to be uh, divided, the a permanova will see the uh, significance of the separation, followed by a, a student t test or a one way ANOVA with a post hoc Uki test to um, hopefully hopefully find the significance of the very uh, the various um, measurements in question. A similarity percentage analysis or a simper analysis was used uh, to see the percentage of contribution that these measurements had in separating the groups. All measure, uh, all analyses were done under the R program using the vegan package. Two additional uh, congener species were used due, there, due to their similarity to uh, species two. Uh, stop type specimens were looked at uh, ho holotypes were used for both species groups. All species were adults and were both female and male. Going into our taxonomic account, starting with Aperture species one. It is a very large species ranging from 72 to 80 centimeters. The color, form, uh, color is uniform and the, with a dark charcoal look. Uh, some areas did not have dermal denticles and created these dark patches, as you can see on the picture, uh, under the mouth and the pleats, behind the pectoral fin, and the distance between the anal fin and pelvic fin. The species also had a small orbital width with a small inner orbital width, and the first dorsal fin was smaller than the second dorsal fin. Dermal denticles were teardropped, almost never overlapping. It had a long snout with a long preoral length. Labral furrows were well developed, uh, very noticeable, and very long, uh, with the upper labial furrows almost equal to their lower. Their mouth was uh, varied in that they were strongly arched to semicircular. Um, their mouth width was larger than the length, and the upper tooth count of the upper jaw was lower, I mean, smaller than the lower jaw tooth count. Uh, general morphology of the teeth, both sharks followed a similar pattern where the central cusp of the upper and lower, or uh, the upper and lower jaw near, nearest to the symphysis of the mouth, both labeled A and C had a strong central cusp with two lateral cusps, but as you move it away from the central synthesis of the mouth, more lateral cusps would appear. And that's where you see the B and D and the smaller structures following the lateral cusps. Uh, typically males had a broader uh, lateral cusps, as you can see compared to B and D in males versus females on their B and D structures. The Aperture species one male had a, a short and robust clasper with dermal denticles located on one side of the clasper with no uh, clasper hooks present. Following on to species two, the first dorsal fin was significantly smaller than the second. Uh, the average total length was 47 to 56 centimeters. It was unique in the color of it being fresh, being so light, having a noticeable light white edge with a white spot at the terminal lobe of the caudal fin, which was noticed after preservation as well. Uh, its orbit length was average. It had a very narrow head with very noticeable labial furrows, which were both equal in length. The mouth was relatively large with the mouth width being larger than the mouth length and the inner orbital length was significantly small. Uh, sexual dimorphism was found in the mouth shape compared to the 
males and females where males had uh, the same kind of noticeable arch in the mouth versus a lower arch in female specimens. Again, the uh, claspers were short and robust, taking only 5 to uh, 5.2 to 5.5 of the total length. Uh, dermal denticles were also located on one side of the clasper, on each clasper. Uh, the clasper hooks were present and are circled in red. Dermal denticles were tricuspid, generally overlapping. The upper tooth counts were more than the lower tooth counts. With multiple lateral cusps, uh, there was an interesting kind of a thing with the lower jaw teeth where you would have a standard kind of a strong central cusp with only two lateral cusps in the one position, but immediately after these, uh, that one into the number two position, noticeable lateral cusp appeared and is very similar to the other uh, lateral teeth as you move away from the jaw. And this was the same for males and females with no noticeable difference between them. Moving on to the statistical results. Here's a list of um, omitted values uh, due to the uh, Due to the analyses, uh, there was no exception for any non-number values. So because of this, I decided to take out these values. Uh, there are significantly more in the sex-specific um, analyses versus the species-specific because one of these specimens was pretty mangled up. So we had to include it into the sex-specific uh, analyses because we were down one specimen to actually run the test itself. But for the species, uh, species specific uh, analyses, this specimen was not used in order to maximize the amount of measurements that we can use. Uh, looking into the comparison of spongiceps groups within the Western Indian Ocean, uh, we saw that species one and species two were uh, spread out apart from each other. Uh, the permanova also supported the significance of this separation. Looking into the values that are of interest, they are the upper and lower labial furrows, uh, the pelvic fin inner margin, uh, the posterior margin of both the pelvic and pectoral fins. Uh, using a t-test, we looked at the uh, difference between them finding uh, significance between the uh, posterior margin of the pelvic and pectoral fins, finding that species one had a smaller uh, pelvic and pectoral uh, posterior margin. Uh, additionally, the other series of measurements were directly related to the position of the first and second dorsal fin uh, relative to the nostril tip meaning that the first dorsal fin insertion and origin, along with the second dorsal fin origin and insertion were located further up into the body in species one compared to species two. Um, moving on, the comparison of the male and female specimens of species two uh, didn't look too promising, but it, there was at least some look of separation, as you can see. But it was only after the permanova was ran that we saw also that the value was not significant enough to separate the centroids. So uh, we decided not to move along, or I decided not to move along with the comparison. Uh, looking in at the uh, var uh, variables of interest, the mouth space, the uh, pelvic fin inner margin and the co uh, caudal terminal lobe posterior margins could be something to look at, but until more specimens uh, are observed or examined, uh, we'll just hold on to that. 
the comparison of species two, Aperturus albosoma and Aperturus aphiotes. Uh, there was what appeared to be a possible separation among the three groups. The permanova uh, supported that the groups were significantly different. Uh, looking at the possible variables of this separation were the third and first skill height, uh, measurements uh, relating to the uh, first dorsal fin, the head width max, the nostril mouth space, and the inner margin of the pelvic and pectoral fins. So this is the simper analysis and the percentage of contribution that was in it. I'm looking at specifically more at the differences between species two and the other congeners, but I did include the Aperturus allosoma and Aperturus aphiotes because the way to actually identify the difference between these are the inner orbital length and the orbit length, and them only having 2% of the uh, percent contribution between the groups. So even though that uh, the values might not have a, a big percentage contribution, this is the official way of dividing the groups. Uh, looking into the head width max and head width at mouth corners, kind of a general head width. Um, the Aperturus species two uh, post hoc uh, two feet test found a uh, significance between Aperture species two and the other two congeners, with Aperture species two having a smaller head length or head width. Uh, going on to interdorsal space, um, Al Aperture albosoma was found to be significantly different, with it having a smaller interdorsal space compared to Aperture species two. Uh, the first dorsal fin base. Aperture species two had a different uh, measurement compared to the Aperture albosoma and Aperture aphiotes. Uh, looking into the inner orbital length, orbit length, and mouth length, <clears throat> interorbital space, uh, Aperture aphiotes two was found significantly different compared to Aperture species two and albosoma. Orbit length. I uh, teased out where all three groups were considered to be different with Aperturus species two being an intermediate between the two congeners and Aperturus albosoma having the smallest orbit length. Uh, mouth length, Aperturus aphiotes was found to be different among the two species with it having a smaller uh, mouth length. So moving on to the discussion, now that we have our information, we can put it into uh, a comparison and see how these apertures tease out within the larger spongiceps group. So starting with aperture species one, uh, we can look at the dermal denticles. As mentioned, it has sparse denticles with little to no overlap and a leaf-like shape. Uh, this description is only found in four aperture species. Uh, these are three images of those species where we can see a more spaced out between Aperturus amphoceps and Buselef with some overlap in Campi, but some of them are spaced out. This is a very large uh, shark. And as you can see, the max length for many of these Aperturus are in the upper 60 centimeter range where Aperturus amphoceps has 87 centimeters. Um, Aperture species one ranges range from 72 to 80 centimeters, which surpasses the max length of uh, the other three Aperture's and puts it well into the range of Aperture's amphiceps. Uh, these, this species has a long pre outer nostril length. Uh, compared to the other four Aperture species, um, Aperture's buselef is has a very narrow range with a very small uh, pre outer length. Aperturus campi range is very large, but starts at a very low end at 2.7% of its total length. And Aperturus amphoceps has the larger with 47 to 6.7% of its total body length. 
Uh, no Aperturus federavi were uh, examined during this study, but a uh, comparison of this length uh, was shown that it follows more closely to Aperturus campi, represented by the triangles and the plus signs. So I went ahead and lumped the two into kind of a same category and saw that it closely resembled that of Aperturus amphiceps, or more closely. Um, a defining characteristic of Aperturus amphiceps is low, broadly rounded anal fin. Uh, this, is, this characteristic has recently been used uh, since that paper in 2008. Um, although I can't see where it can be, uh, be useful to use, I feel that this characteristic varies a lot. Just to give you my example, these are anal fins from Aperturus species one. As you can see, they vary greatly. And honestly, I can argue for it to be kind of any one of these types of shapes. So I will not necessarily use this as one of the defining characteristics of identifying uh, this species. Along with the original description of Aperturus amphiceps, there were no mention of clasper hooks, whether present or absent. Uh, not all measurements were used, where out of the 75 measurements, only 42 were listed. Uh, there were a uh, there was a considerable difference in space between the inner orbital space of Aperturus species one and Aperturus amphiceps, where species one had a smaller inner orbital uh, space. The male in this specimen was significantly smaller than what's been recorded in the type series, where 54 centimeters total length would be well in the range of juvenile sharks, but this shark had a classified uh, calcified clasper and the length would suggest that it is uh, an adult male. But because uh, type material was not fully obser observed and not to fall in any of the classic traps of you know, splitting the species, I went to the conservative route and just named it Aperturus amphiceps. Uh, they were caught on the south end of the Madagascar Ridge on Walter Shoal and on the Southwest Indian Ridge. Moving on to species two. Uh, as mentioned, this color is pretty unique when fresh. Only two Aperturus are known to have this white uh, look to them, Aperturus albosoma and Aperturus aphioides. This does not consider preservation changes or natural variations. And I've seen Aperturus go from light brown to a yellow, so it's good to actually look at different characteristics as well. Kind of following the same uh, pattern, we'll look at the dermal denticles. Um, Aperturus uh, species two had a tricuspid broad look to them with overlapping features, so that eliminated some species right there with Aperturus albosoma and species two having a small first dorsal compared to the second dorsal fin, where other species of Aperturus, like Aperturus aphioides, has a, a sub-equal to equal first dorsal fin shapes and size. Uh, this eliminates another group of Aperturus. Uh, Aperturus species two has a very uh, narrow head length compared to the uh, very obvious wide head length and also very considerably large head length of Aperturus buccellif and pinguis. Um, our species found that it had a pre-oral length that was less than or equal to 1.5 times the max head, which was different from both buccellif and pinguis. And Aperturus river eye finally having a max total length of 48 centimeters, where species two had a max length of at least 56 centimeters, putting it well above uh, Aperturus river eye. Finally, leaving Aperturus albosoma. Um, characteristics that can actually separate the two groups are the caudal fin dermal denticles, where on Aperturus albosoma, they have a compact uh, set of dermal denticles on the caudal fin margin, where Aperturus species two is widely spaced. Uh, oral papilla was used as a way to separate the 
to species. This technique is typically used with uh, another group of uh, cat sharks, the Bithylurus. Um, this seemed to be another characteristic used to tease them apart, where Aperturus albosoma have these finger-like, well-defined digits on the top of the mouth, compared to Aperturus species two, where they weren't present, and if they were, they kind of had more of like these pimple-like structures to them. Uh, tooth counts were also somewhat lower in species two compared to Albosoma. Uh, Clasper hooks were present in Aperturus species two. Uh, this is not present in um, Aperturus Albosoma. This was confirmed both by the examination and in the literature. This uh, characteristic does not vary. And also, as we know, is not always reported with other species, but we are fortunate enough to know that albosoma does not have them. Looking at the morphology, uh, Aperturus species two had a shorter head width and a shorter inner orbital width. Uh, a slightly longer orbital uh, length for Aperturus species two with a longer inner dorsal space and a slightly shorter first dorsal base uh, fin base. The ratio measurement of the caudal terminal lobe fin length times its height was longer in Aperture species two compared to Albosoma. And with that, um, I believe that the species could be a potentially a new species to the literature, but more confirmation will be needed to separate it. Uh, this species was found in the uh, southwest Indian Ridge and at the south end of the Madagascar Ridge on Walter Shoal, with a star denoting the possible holotype. Going to my conclusions and management implications, 182 new Chondrichthyan species have been named in the past decade, with about 20% described from the western Indian Ocean. This is a global hotspot for Chondrichthyan biodiversity, with many of the species being endemic to the area. And realizing this, the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations calls upon nations to develop a national plan of action, outlining a key initiative to improve species identification of Chondrichthyans. Uh, the validation of these two species new to the region will hopefully uh, prove useful to future taxonomic fisheries management and conservation efforts in the Western Indian Ocean. Uh, in the practical sense of putting this information out there is uh, back in 2014, I had a very amazing opportunity to go to the island of Mauritius and help out at a FAO workshop, which was uh, pretty much focused on identifying deep sea chondrichthians. I helped about uh, people from uh, representatives from about 20 nations and how to identify these species using the same uh, terminology and techniques I was talking to you this past half hour. And they all had their very own FAO field guide to hopefully teach other people as well. Uh, kind of in conclusion is that Aperturus was a great research opportunity in the sense that there's no fishery for them. They're very easily accessed and in bycatch. And because of this, I was able to um, not only study uh, these species kind of in great number, but also develop skills that would hopefully be used to identify, you know, possibly not only species in the genus, but in other genera as well. Uh, the use for this can hopefully go into uh, Future Nations uh, National Plan of Action and in, uh, instilling a conservation policies incorporated in them. And with that, I'd like to send out my acknowledgements. Uh, first, thanking Dr. Scott Hamilton, Dr. Ivano Ayalo, and Dr. David Ebert. Uh, well, all right, it's gonna be short and sweet and I'm trying not to cry over live stream. So Dr. Scott Hamilton. Scott, thank you so much for everything you've done. Um, uh, your classes were definitely some of my favorite 
uh, classes to take. You're very knowledgeable, very easily easily approach. And, you know, every time at least I had a question with you, you were pretty, you know, willing to sit down and at least hash out a lot of things I may not understand the first go around, but thank you for uh, giving me kind of, you know, free range and trying to figure out how to do this project. <laughs> Um, Ivano, thank you very much uh, for uh, creating a whole class based on my needs. Uh, originally, I had uh, asked to use the SEM machine since 2012, and way later on, we finally got around to it, and I, I was able to use some of the images I got from that class on my thesis. So. You know, even though I wasn't able to use the SEM for my final project, I, you know, definitely wanted to put in the, the images in there. Uh, oh, man. All right, Dave. Uh, thanks a lot for everything. Um, it's, it's been really long. Uh, I have a lot of things to thank you for. Uh, traveled the world with you. Um, was able to meet a lot of amazing people through you. And uh, I mean, lived with you for three years, so I got to know you really well. Uh, I, I thank you for everything you've done, everything you've shown me, and every opportunity that's been bestowed upon me. Uh, one of those weird things that happened, I mean, not too long ago was contacting Dr. Sato and possibly going to Japan and and looking at things for the, the thesis and having him open our models and directly contact me with Nakaya and uh, the head uh, museum curator of the university there and him saying, you know, this is Dave's student, please take care of him. And it, it really said a lot and I'm very grateful that I had kind of this experience going through this project with you and uh, like to also go with uh, so thank you to funding uh, Gavin Naylor through an NSF grant funded a good portion of the study. I also got funding from the Bill Watson Memorial Scholarship. I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Ross Shatton, Mr. Mari and the captain and crew of the FV will watch which were integral parts to the study and collect and uh, getting specimens and kind of having this thing go down uh all the staff at the museums i visited the Inter uh, the national history museum of paris the university of hamburg and the scripps institute of oceanography oh man all right i got this all right uh paul so um it's also another person that's been very involved in my life. Uh, summer of 2012, uh, I remember first meeting you and asking you about all the weird sharks after everyone was saying, Paul's sharks are really stinking up the courtyard. I obviously was very interested in following up with you and you welcomed me with uh, open arms and uh, you taught me a lot of things and uh, became my mentor and my good friend. And if Dave's like, a, you know, kind of like a professional father figure, you're definitely like a big brother to me. Uh, uh, thank you for everything you've done and I hope for the best for all your endeavors. Uh, followed on with Alexandra Mayer, Amber Riker, and Stephanie Schneider. You guys <clears throat> were integral. Uh, you guys showed me a lot of support, um, unconditional support. And this project could have not been done without your help and guidance and you know any type of insight you had. You're susceptible to my 3 a.m. panic attacks and asking for questions. And I thank you guys every day uh, for helping me out. Of course, no uh, thesis uh, talk is complete without thanking Tara Egging. Uh, I, it's even hard to even describe. I can thank you so many times, and I still feel it's not enough. 
uh, <clears throat> you've helped me out with a lot of uh, financial issues, uh, uh, dealing with SJSU and them. Um, a lot of paperwork done through you, and you were also just a friendly ear when I needed it. I always enjoyed visiting, and I hope to see you again. Uh, Kathleen Donahue, um, when you originally um, posted up on the Moss Landing email that they needed a new face of the lab, I said, of course, I'm the perfect option. And I'm glad that you saw it too. <laughs> um, but no, I'm just saying that I really want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to to work with you and have a stable job. I mean, that's 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 something that I was grateful for, and not having to worry for you know just doing a lot of contract gigs and stuff. So. You uh, definitely helped me out a lot, along with the, all the front desk uh, workers. You guys are great. Uh, <clears throat> the Greater Moss Landing, PSRC, and Shock guys, uh, you guys all helped me out in all various ways. Uh, obviously, in this um, thesis, there are only 20 sharks that were measured, but you know I've measured over 200 plus sharks. And that couldn't have been done without you guys. Um, specifically, I would like to thank Alex Olson and Vivian Tallinn. You guys spent the most time with me, hours putting up the smell, putting up with me. Uh, no amount of thank yous can be expressed for it. All my friends and family uh, from abroad here in Los Angeles, back over there, you guys are always the ones that kept me sane and help me when I was hungry or didn't have a place to stay. And then finally, my parents. Um, I thank them for everything they've given to me. Uh, they came to this country with only $200, made the American dream, and you know, made a life for themselves and everything. And I like to think that you know, this project was kind of an extension of their time here. And in its own way, I'd like to dedicate this to them. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. With that, uh, that's it. And we'll take any questions. No, oh, man, sorry. Right. Thanks, Justin. That was that was awesome. Uh, great. If anybody has any questions, um, please uh, raise your hand, and uh, we'll unmute mute you. Any questions? Justin, I have a question for you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, since you, I'll turn my video. Since you think that you, and you have some solid evidence for backing up your conclusion that you might've just found a new species, do you, are you gonna continue working on this? Would you be interested in continuing to see if you can follow through with possibly identifying and like making that a official taxonomic category, this new species that you might have. Yeah, found. definitely, definitely. Uh, it's uh, in the works, so no official names or anything yet. So it's it's in the works. Okay, cool. So you're gonna be working on that. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, definitely, nice. yeah. And I don't know, hopefully brought in us uh, to, what does it go into uh, the different uh, subgroups in the area? I mean, what is it? two of those four uh, type specimens are missing from that area. So a new designation could be very useful, especially as we find new specimens, like just to essentially update the literature and hopefully go from there. Cool, congratulations, that's really cool. Thank you. Cool. Scott, you have a, you have a question? Hey, Justin, great job. Thank you. Thank fun. You. I like seeing especially all the extra photos and made me trying to, man. It's like, like a taxonomic, yeah. yeah, taxonomic talk. Like, how do you make that entertaining? You know, <laughs> I, lo I loved all your detective work at the end. That was great. That was a fun way to walk us through kind of. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, yeah, like, like Emily was asking, I mean, 
So, I mean, if this does end up being a new species, that's amazing. What if it ends up being that other species that it looks kind of similar to, the Albasoma? Would that be a big range extension? Like where, I forget from reading, reading your thesis, where does the Aperasturus Albasoma actually, is? where is it known to occur versus where you found the specimen? Right, so the two close congeners, Aphiodes and Albasoma, where Aphiodes in, is in the North Atlantic and the Albasoma is more in the, was it New Caledonia area? So it is Indo-Pacific uh, region. So I, I am open to it, but like I mentioned, the clasper hooks is like a pretty like big flag to like not overlook too much. Uh, the, what is it? Papilla is kind of new. Like I know it's been used, but looking at all the literature, it was just like, no mention. So I just thought like this could be a possible thing to look into. Uh, previous, what is it? Uh, books and kind of like, what is it? Expeditions have listed a Albasoma like uh, specimen to occur in the area. So I, I would like to see it kind of come into fruition where it's like, uh, I'm going to pretty much put it in list of reasons why. And if it does come out to be that way, then so be it. But also, I'm not going to look away uh, like a genetic analysis. And if we do find this to be just another species, then it's, hey, it's a range of extinction. We didn't know this uh, uh, be in this area, but you know, now we have the de definite answer for it. Yeah, but that would be quite a range extension, I guess, right, into a whole new ocean basin, so. Yeah. Right, exactly, and like, you know, you see them, they're not strong swimmers or anything, so it, it like, there are range extensions, and there is controversy to the validity of some of these. I mean, I saw one specimen when I was in Hamburg um, that was listed as a specimen uh that as a longicephalus where I kind of just thought mm, maybe not but obviously that's kind of like a way down the line when I'm probably doing this like full time or something like that where it's just like I see people putting range extensions where it might not be versus uh kind of a uh what is it not being able to divide I guess the species uh uh, in regions and actually designating them as range extensions. Because that'll also go kind of with uh, Aperture Amphiceps, but I think the closest region that they're located is like the west side of the um, uh, Australian shores. So that's more believable, but like you said, it's it's kind of a bigger jump for- Yeah, that's still the same ocean basin. So, so are genetics in the works? I mean, is that the way that you need to, is that what you need, I guess, to solve this, you know, this this issue? Uh, there is, uh, there is genetics. I mean, all of the, what is it? Um, all the specimens, pictures, and genetic work has been collected, uh, by Paul. So there is, uh, uh, samples that were sent to Dr. Gavin Naylor to run it because this is kind of a subgrouping of the, uh, greater tree of life of chondrichthians, which has a very significant, like, bite into, uh, genetics. So, there's preliminary work, but because my study didn't really touch it, I kind of also didn't really go into talking too much about genetics, but yeah. I, I just, if I just might inject, I, I don't think we, they have tissue samples for albosoma, for sure, true albosoma. So oh, okay. If, so even though the genetics, I think have been run on Gavin, or excuse me, Gavin ran the genetics, I don't think he has true albosoma, so you don't, you can't really compare it directly to the true albasoma to say, yes, it's different. Got it. Yeah. So, so. so yeah, in the works. You know, Other hopefully. expedition. Go fishing again. I know, right? <laughs> that won't be a problem. Thanks, Justin. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Did anyone, anyone else have any, uh, have any questions for Justin? I, I might add, when Justin first showed up here, he had his hair was cut real short and he was clean shaven and everything. And I just want to say I had no influence on his present uh, state of uh, appearance so i think that had more to do with his writing up his thesis over the last uh six nine months <laughs> yeah right yeah so um anyways vaccinated uh, gonna go get a haircut soon yeah so if it, uh, anyway any final any last last call any final questions uh for justin all right i'll ask him one more if no one's asking questions okay what about um so i'm curious sort of how abundant were 
these species in the trawls? Like, would you get one per trawl, one every 10 trawls? I mean, it's sort of, what do you think the impacts are on, on their populations of the, the fishing in the area? Uh, I did not look at that data and Paul Clerken was the one that collected these specimens. So maybe he, maybe these were questions that he may have uh, had while he was out there, like what was versus one bigger of these species versus the other. Um, these, you know, are just typically demersal species. So anywhere near uh, sea mount would probably be a good uh, hit. The lower, the better, but, you know, not to say that's the only spot to get them. Uh, I wouldn't say any seasonal kind of variations would matter uh, that deep. So probably not that. Um, but yeah, I think that'd be a general kind of idea is kind of get close to sea mounts and maybe. If I could just inject, I think one of the things too, in this area they were fishing, it was a generally a clean fishery in the sense they didn't touch bottom. They were fishing off the bottom for the uh, Alpha Sino and the Orange Ruffy. And so the, the specimens they were catching were ones that were off the bottom because the bottom terrain is extremely jagged and rocky, very steep relief. So they're fishing off the bottom and not on the bottom, which usually reduce, which often reduces some of these demersal, the catch of some of these demersal species. So, and I, and I, don't, and I only add that in because I don't think, I saw some of the video footage they take when we were out in Mauritius and I don't think Justin was, had seen some of that from a, that was a previous workshop I'd been to through FAO that uh, uh, Paul or Justin were not at, though Paul may have seen some of the video separately. So anyway, if, if no one else has any um, final questions, I want to thank everybody. Kenneth does. <laughs> Kenneth does. Yeah. yeah, I'm here. <laughs> hey, Justin. Awesome, yep. man. Really appreciate know, your, right? uh, pulling it together, you know, and it was a very difficult time to do all that because, uh, you know, as, as you can imagine, um, it, it wasn't just the last, you know, several years, but th this last year in particular, um, but uh, really appreciated uh, you um, seeing you um, get it all together. And I just want to thank you also for being uh, such a wonderful student in my class. And uh, you're one of those students who make uh, being a faculty member, you know, a joyous experience. And so got to thank you for that. Well, um, thank you, Kenneth. That means a lot. Good, uh, good luck with your uh, uh, subsequent publications, I'm hoping. And um, and uh, your subsequent career. Uh, good luck to you. And thanks so much for a wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you, Kenneth. Good. I, I see Chris Chabot has his hand raised. Chris? Yeah, he hey, doesn't Chris. get to escape without me asking a question or two. I mean, of on. course. I already regret it. <laughs> no, <I'm> <laughs> no, great job, Justin. It was really, really good. Uh, and I've been following you for years. So obviously, I'm, I'm very happy to see you make it to this point. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, so based on obviously the journey, uh, kind of a three point question. First is what was the most challenging part of all of this? And that's something you can always share for anyone looking to do research in the future, some young person coming up through AES or whatever. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> then I think the, uh, the well, maybe not three point, I'm just being simple. The next point is, all right, I will do. Okay, we'll do that. Okay. Um, what was the, so most challenging number one, number two would be, what surprised you about your findings? I and mean, was there something that really stuck out years ago? Oh, I was not expecting to see this. I mean, because a lot of times when we do stuff, we're always opening up new questions. There's always something that comes out. It's like, oh, I had no clue this was coming out of this. So, you know, kind of what was, what was new to you that we really weren't expecting? And I think ultimately, what do you think is the coolest thing of this project? You know, if you were trying to sell this and, and do that soundbite, you know, they always talk about do your soundbite. You know, Dave's oh. got... I'm a professional of the lost sharks and sound bites. So go you, Dave. Um, no, man, that's, there's well, other you places do it? where it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if I was going to go with uh, the most challenging thing, uh, funding, that's a pretty big one. I did not mention that uh, taxonomy is usually underfunded in a lot of cases. And Jerry looked over as like, oh, we already know all the sharks out there. So why do we need to keep doing this? Or why do we need to know any more of it? So that's generally kind of like the issue is like, it's there's not a lot of funding opportunities. So um, a good portion of the thesis and like, you know, going to these museums and, you know, far off lands and stuff was self-funded. Um, I guess uh, the thing that I 
I, it's a funny one. I guess the thing I didn't realize that I, you know, kind of stumbled onto was, uh, so Clasper anatomy was not my strong suit and probably like the <laughs> last thing I like got to learning. And I think I just also made it like a Valentine's tradition to just learn about the anatomy of claspers. Like, you know, I'll just spend time alone and just read about this. And then finally getting all my notes together and everything after the trips almost and everything, I started looking at the pictures. I'm like, wait, are these those clasper hooks I keep like reading about? Like, is this like something that like uh, is like a pretty good indicator? So that was kind of a big kind of like, oh man, that's crazy thing. Another was uh, looking at the oral papilla. Uh, Dave had mentioned oral papilla to me because he had described that bifolar species and then saying that, oh, we, we separated by the oral papilla and I just never knew what that was. I've never seen it or anything like that. So it wasn't until I was at the, you know, the Paris Museum uh, of Natural History in this bunker where I'm just like looking at like uh, the, the teeth and I just kind of noticed kind of in the periphery of the, my eye just like wait what is that and then kind of like another kind of like whoa is that that thing Dave keeps talking about that I don't know that what it looks like and I try to take as many photos as I can send them an email kind of in the middle of the night just saying what are these oral papillas he whatsapps me in the middle of the night <laughs> oral papilla that tells you about my life. I'm actually, I actually looking at him at two in the morning, answering the guy. <laughs> That's yes, a good mentor. mentor. Please confirm. <laughs> uh, and then uh, I don't know, like, what's the coolest sound bite in this? I mean, obviously, it's just like, you know, I always like cocktail party just like hey i'm discovering new species of sharks kind of thing like yeah hey, you know that's a cool thing. We didn't know this was in this area. Now we found this new shark. So, you know, you get, you know, um, to designate it and stuff and you know but with that comes you know people like thinking that you're swimming with the sharks and stuff like that so you know you also have to kind of keep it in reality and tone it down a bit it can't be you know swimming with the sharks and stuff great job cool yeah thank thanks chris um anybody else have any uh have any questions for justin Anyone? Anyone? Going once, twice? Okay, I don't see any other hands coming up. So I, I want to thank everyone for coming today. And, and again, Justin, that was an awesome thesis defense. I appreciate it. And if uh, Scott Novano can uh,